Hebrews. Um, both of these books, ironically, are among the most neglected books in the Bible. Um, it's the, Leviticus is the first book that's studied by a Jew in the synagogue, uh, perhaps the last book that's studied or read, if even ever, in a believer's life, sadly. And we understand why. It, you, you begin to, someone says, I'm going to read the Bible, and they read through Genesis, and they read through Exodus, and they get to Leviticus, and it's a bit of a challenge because it's, it's all sacrifices and priesthoods and ceremonies, which seems, uh, face value, to be so irrelevant to a, to a, to a Christian. However, um, it all speaks of Christ. And again, we said it in, in the inset that if you take a step back and you begin to see that, the shadows and the typology, and it's all taking us uh, to see uh, Christ more clearly and understand the gospel more clearly. So we're going to see through all the ceremonies, all the rituals, all the sacrifices, um, uh, it all points to Christ. And only God could set this up in such a way that even the details in the Old Testament sacrifices have meaning in the sacrifice of Christ. Um, One of the reasons having Bible classes like this is so crucial for a believer is because you, you, when you begin to see those types of things, it is so strengthening for your faith, uh, the foundation of our faith being the Word. And as we get such a sure foundation in seeing that the Bible is certainly the Word of God, our faith has, has, is so strengthened by that. So um, remember we said that the tabernacle and the various parts are just a shadow of the heavenly reality. In the book of Hebrews... Uh, the Greek words that are used, that the tabernacle is a pattern or these things are a copy or a shadow, uh, all mean these types of things. So um, uh, analogy, print, stamp, shadow, they're all meanings for the Greek words that are used. Think about what that's saying. That is saying, that's the writer of Hebrews saying that the Old Testament tabernacle and the priesthood and the sacrifices and the feasts and the Sabbath days all of them are like a model to help us understand the reality. It's if, as if you would get a model of a... Uh, uh, in the war, they're looking at the, the, the map of the land. And that's a, just a, an image, a model of the reality to help them plan and understand the real thing. Or you model of a car, whatever it might be, some type of prototype. And that's exactly what the writer of Hebrews is saying, that the Old Testament practices and priesthood is a figure of the reality. And in the afterglow of last week's class, a few of us were standing outside and, and thinking about, it's incredible that the, the real priesthood is the priesthood that we have. The Aaronic priesthood uh, under Aaron um, was a type, a shadow, a figure that was looking to the priesthood that we now have, the eternal priesthood under our high, high priest Jesus Christ. So incredible to think of those things, that the tabernacle is a model to help us understand how man approaches God. The offerings or the sacrifices, again, foreshadow some of the great doctrines of the church and our justification, our sanctification. The priesthood itself, again, just an earthly shadow of the priesthood we have and the feasts, incredibly, uh, it's incredible to think of this, but lay out a prophetic timeline of the first and second coming of Christ. So it makes it so exciting to study uh, this book. So some key words in the book will help us get a taste of the theme. Holiness is a key theme in this book, 87 times, just in these 27 chapters. Uh, sin or unclean or equivalent words, 194 times, showing that God is holy and man is not, and that's a problem. So the answer is blood here used 86 times, atonement 42 times, sacrifice 42 times, and priest 189 times. So we can get a pretty good taste of what the book's about from those most commonly used uh, words. If we were going to break down the book, give us a quick outline, Uh, we could see the first 10 chapters we could call the way to God, and that is through sacrifice. 
That message is made crystal clear in the Old Testament, and it's the same in the New Testament. Our way to God is through sacrifice, through the ultimate finished work sacrifice of Christ on the cross, to which all of these point to. I remember being a new Christian when I first heard and understood that. It blew my mind to think that all of the Old Testament sacrifices were were waiting and pointing to the finished work of Christ. And then the second part of the book, uh, chapters 11 to the end, a walk with God through sanctification. And these speak about different uh, uh, aspects of living, ceremonial laws, etc., um, observing the feasts. So way to God through sacrifice and a walk with God through sanctification. So it definitely applies to the believers. Um, one little interesting note here, I, I remember realizing this many years ago, um, that if you take the first verse of these initial books of the Bible, uh, each, each initial verse gives you the flavor or the direction of that book. Let's have a look. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God spoke, God said, God created, right? That's the book of origins. Exodus 1.1, these are the names of those who went to Egypt. And of course, we know that that's the premise of the book is their deliverance from Egypt uh, heading to the promised land. Leviticus 1.1, where we are now, now the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tabernacle. We saw the tabernacle instituted and constructed in Exodus at the end, but you're left with the question, okay, well, how do we use the tabernacle? Now we've got it. And Leviticus answers that question. Um, It's really kind of like a handbook for the priesthood, how how you would make the sacrifices, etc. Numbers 1.1 is the next book we'll study. That's the wandering book of their journey through the wilderness. You can see the first book, uh, first verse. Now, the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness. Deuteronomy 1.1, these are the words which Moses spoke to Israel on this side of the Jordan. And that's Moses' last address to the people on the east side of the Jordan before the people crossed over, which they ultimately did with Joshua. If you look at Joshua 1.1, after the death of Moses, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, arise and go over this Jordan. So that gives us the the direction of the book of Joshua. So just a little interesting footnote there in the first verses. So again, how to use the tabernacle. This wasn't left to man's imagination. It's meticulously laid out, and particularly in this book. Uh, Leviticus answers those questions and gives the priesthood the, the clear, laid-out definition on what sacrifices are to be made when and how for each uh, situation. Um, it would be an, an, uh, an example might be you, you might go to a factory uh, where they're producing something, making cars or something, and you walk in and you see people, people running around and smoke and noise and machinery and you make no sense of it. Um, and people are using vocabulary you don't understand and you, you have no idea what, what is the purpose of this factory. And then the owner of the factory might come out, take you by the hand, lead you to the end of the production line, show you the finished product, uh, maybe walk you through the factory and show you how each part is so crucial in producing the finished product. And we can see that that analogy can be found here. When we understand the finished product is Christ, all of this is, is looking to, effectively, the atonement for man's sins, which could not be... Um, perfect under the law, under the Aaronic priesthood, but is perfect under the work and the priesthood of Christ. A key verse of the book would be Leviticus 20, 26. Uh, You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples so that you should be mine. I am holy. I have separated you. Who's he talking to? Israel. He says, Israel, I have separated you from the people, from the surrounding nations. I have separated you. I have set you apart that you will be my, my, my possession, my precious people. I will be your God and you will be my people. And that thought of sanctification, again, directly applies to the church. Um, that we are, we are in the world, but we are, we are set apart unto God. Um, in our lives. This is a New Testament principle. When we hear the word holy, though, 
we can be a bit turned off by the idea because unfortunately we have this religious, pious idea that goes with the word. Um, but Psalm 29.2 speaks of the beauty of holiness. It's not some self-righteous, pie-in-the-sky religious concept, but it is something that is beautiful. It speaks of the freedom, the victory, the wholeness of a grace believer. That's holiness. We were made for holiness. Unfortunately, we are fallen and we cleave to the dust, but we were made to be victorious, to be free, to be pure. Um, and that's what the, 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 this book looks to, holiness. Um, but again, a holiness which we cannot achieve, which we cannot um, maintain or achieve. Uh, it doesn't come by works or keeping the law, but it's something that comes through grace, through a work of God in our life. So holiness is, is a theme. It looks to the sinner, cries out, be holy, and the sinner says, I, I can't. And God has a solution. What is it? It's the, it's the tabernacle again which points to the cross. So if we look at the opening verse, the Lord calls Moses and spoke to him from the tent of the meeting, which is the tabernacle, saying, speak to the people of Israel when any man brings an offering to the Lord. There it is. And this is going to go on to, to begin to define. When any man would bring an offering to the Lord, and he gives the answer and the definition for it all. The animals that were permitted to be used in sacrifices are given. Here are the main ones here. The bullock or the ox, the ram, the goat, the dove, or the pigeon. And in this book, pretty much Leviticus 1 through 5, there's a little bit of overlap with the chapters, but each one of those chapters lays out the five main offerings, which are as so. Chapter 1, the burnt offering. We'll speak about them shortly. Chapter 2, the meal offering. Sometimes in King James, I think it's the meat offering, but it's, it's, there's no meat involved. It's really a cereal offering or a grain offering. Um, chapter 3, the peace offering. Chapter 4, the sin offering. And chapter 5, trespass offering. Now, the reason from our New Testament vantage point that there are five different offerings is because no one offering could completely give the full picture of the different aspects of Christ's one offering. So each one of these five shows us a different aspect of Christ's offering on the cross. Amazing. Um, they're listed in this order because uh, primarily because the first, uh, the first three are what's called sweet-smelling offerings or voluntary offerings. Um, we read that phrase in the New Testament about Christ. In Ephesians 5.2, he was a sweet-smelling offering. And you read that, and what does that mean? And it, it means um, that there's no compulsion. You're not obligated to do this. It's a free will offering. From the heart, you choose to do it. Christ was that offering motivated by love. And this was an offering that a, a Jew would, would bring and make to the Lord, the, 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 uh, the burnt offering, for example, the most common of the offerings, would do it as an expression of thankfulness and praise to God. And of course, it's not, he's not obligated to do it. So what a sweet-smelling fragrance that is to the Lord. Someone willingly choosing to do it uh, from a thankful heart. Uh, the, the last two, the sin and the trespass offering in this list, are compulsory offerings. They are, you are obligated to, to make those offerings. We'll talk about that as we go. Um, so this is how the offerings are initially listed. When they are then told, when, when the definition for the, observing them takes place, the order changes. Uh, now, peace offering, which in the initial list is number three, when it speaks about observing them, peace offering is put on the end. And the reason for that, of course, is because peace ultimately is, a re is the result of all of the other, other offerings. We are uh, therefore being justified by faith. We have peace with God. So uh, that's why the order changes. So let's, let's have a look at some of them. Let's... Uh, 
So here you can see the cross and these five different types of offerings, the, the burnt, the grain, the peace, the sin, and the trespass offerings, all different aspects of the one offering of Christ. And we'll start with the, sorry, with the burnt offering, the burnt offering. So this is pretty much in Leviticus 1. Um, the morning and evening, the priests would offer their national uh, offering. It would be a burnt offering every morning, every evening, um, uh, showing thanksgiving and gratitude for what God has done and what God had given. Again, a free will offering. It always had to be a male without blemish. Beautiful pictures of Christ. A male offering. Um, the first fruit of the flock, the best of the flock, or the um, and... Um, and a male uh, in the prime of life, all pictures of Christ. Um, in Malachi 1, the Lord had a problem with Israel because they were offering the lame and the blind and the, the worst of the flock, and the Lord had a problem with that. He, he said, no, I'm not going to accept those. You offer the, the best of the flock, the first fruits. The offerer would lay his hands on the sacrifice, uh, the offerer would choose his animal, bring it to the tabernacle, come through the gate to the burnt altar uh, uh, where the, um, where the uh, priest would be. He would lay his hands on the animal, and in some cases, in certain offerings, he would confess his sins over the animal. And the, the, the act was understood that there would be his confession of his sins, and there was an understanding, an identification that this animal was going to be his substitute. It's very graphic, very powerful. I mean, it, what, what a very potent image for, for the, the, the sinner to go through. I will bring an innocent animal whose life will be taken from my own. And that substitution was understood. And the imputation was understood. As I confess my sins with my hands on the animal... There was an understanding that my sins were imputed to that animal and I went away forgiven and free. Um, well, let's not go there yet. So, uh, when the offerer would bring the burnt offering, the offerer himself would kill the animal. The priest would then take the blood and apply the blood, but the offerer would, would uh, have to kill the animal. He'll do that on the north side of the altar. The priest would then sprinkle the blood around the altar. Uh, the priest would skin the animal, cut it into pieces, and burn the portions on the altar. Remember the burnt, uh, the uh, brazen altar, the first altar when you came in, the altar of sacrifice, or it's also called the uh, place of slaughter. Um, uh, that, that fire was always to be burning. And people will be bringing their sacrifices again and again and again, and continual sacrifices were being uh, made on that altar. So the priest would, the offerer would lay his hands on the animal, he would sacrifice the animal, the priest would then skin it and cut it into pieces, put it on the brazen altar where it would be consumed as a burnt offering uh, to the Lord. Um, in some of the offerings out of these five, the priests would afterwards be able to partake of the meat. Um, the offerer was only able to partake of one of the offerings. After it was offered, he could eat only with the peace offering. That's the only offering where he would actually not just be a spectator, but be a partaker in the offering. And there's a beautiful message there, that we, we partake of the peace uh, that comes through the sacrifice. Um, but in this offering, not even the priest was able to partake. This, the burnt offering was completely burned and consumed and offered to God. The priest had no, no part in it, and the offerer had no part of it. For, for this signifies that salvation is completely a work of God for man. Man does not partake in, of, of that offering at all. And the offering was totally consumed. Nothing was eaten. And this offering was according to possession. What does that mean? It means depending on what I had, what I owned or what I could get my hands on would be the animal that would be offered. If I could, I would offer a bull. If not, I would offer a sheep or a goat, and etc. Um, you remember actually Mary and Joseph when they came and made an offering in Luke 1. 
they only could offer a pigeon. It shows their poverty at the time when they offered that burnt offering in the temple. Um, And of course, Christ is our burnt offering. He was a male without blemish in the prime of life. He was a sweet-smelling offering in the fact that he, Galatians 1.9, gave himself, offered himself. Uh, John 10.17, the good shepherd laid down his life for the sheep. Um, uh, Philippians 2 is a beautiful passage for this, that he was obedient as a servant even to death, even to the death of the cross. Um, And of course, our offerings, how this relates to us, uh, we bring offerings to God also. But our offerings are offerings, Hebrews 13, 17. We bring a sacrifice of praise, an offering of thanksgiving from our lips. Or Romans 12, 2, we, um, we present our bodies a living sacrifice to him. But, but our offerings are based on the finished work of Christ. That's the offering for our salvation. The second offering that's mentioned is the meal offering or the grain offering. Now, in all other offerings, there is blood involved. This is the only offering where there is no blood. And uh, this is because this pictures the humanity of Christ, the sinless life of Christ, not the death, but the life of Christ, that he was without sin, that he had a perfect life. Um, This could be offered in three ways. This offering was according to property. It depended what what you owned, if you had some type of oven or, or which kind of pan you had depends on how you could prepare your grain or your meal and what offering you would bring. It could be uncooked flour. You would just bring some flour and it would be burned on the altar. You could bring unleavened cakes or roasted grain, uh, all which were acceptable in this offering. So Christ, our meal offering, shows us that in his humanity he was um, without spot, without sin. Uh, the, the, fi- the flour had to be ground incredibly fine with no lumps in it, no coarse grain. Um, if our life was made into flour, it would be a little bit lumpy. It would be a bit coarse. But Christ's life, without sin, perfectly obedient to the will of the Father and keeping the law. Um, He was the grain that died, was crushed in the mill of Gethsemane, burned in the oven of Calvary to be the bread of life for all men. In this offering, there were two things that were not to be in it. No leaven. We know what that means. Remember, leaven speaks of sin in the Bible. No leaven. And also no honey. Uh, Honey was a, um, a, a natural sweetener. Sugar was a refined sweetener. Honey was natural. Um, Speaking of natural goodness. Uh, Some people think of Christ in that way. Oh, he was a good man. He was a prophet. It was about morality. He was an example. But no honey was allowed. Not natural goodness. But he had an obedient walk of faith before the Father. And three things that had to be present were oil, frankincense, and salt. Oil had to be mingled with the flour, had to be on and in it. The Holy Spirit was on Christ as the anointed one and, of course, in him from from the womb. Um, And uh, he was the anointed one. And uh, frankincense was something that became effective through burning, through his uh, humanity and his trials and Gethsemane. We think of the prayers and the uh, uh, vertical he had with the Father, and then salt was to be given with every offering um, was a preservative and also bringing out the flavor. The offerer would come to the door, no real ceremony involved, offer his meal offering. The priest would offer a handful on the altar and the rest would be for the priest to partake of in their surface, service. Um, we'll go to the sin offering next. We'll do the peace offering at the end. The sin offering, this was according to position. This wasn't according to what you had or what you possessed, but it was according to who you were. If you were a priest, a bull or an ox would be offered. If you were a member of the congregation, if it was for the full congregation, also a bull. 
If it was for a ruler, a male goat. If it was for a commoner, a female goat. So depending on who you were would depend on what offering would be made for your sin. This was a compulsory offering. If that you had sinned and in your own heart and conscience you wanted to make that right with God, you would do that by bringing an offering to the, to the temple, uh, to the tabernacle or, or to the temple. Um, the priest would uh, uh, sprinkle the blood uh, again, the offerer would would uh, would lay his hands on the animal. The animal would be slain at the at the door, and um, that picture, by the way, when when he's laying his hands and confessing his sin, that's a picture of the moment when our sins were put on Christ on the cross, um, when he said, "Father, my my God, why have you forsaken me?" First uh, Peter, First um, Peter. I think it's 2.22 or something, where it says that he bore our sins on his body. That was the moment. Our sins, past, present, and future of every man, woman, and child. He bore on his body and was judged in our place. Uh, so that would be laying on our hands. The priest would then take the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord. And the order of how he would sprinkle the blood is beautifully laid out. It says that he would go into the tabernacle, he would sprinkle the blood before the veil, which of course is the veil of separation because of sin, before the veil, he would sprinkle it at the altar of incense, remember, which is the altar just before the veil, on the brazen altar where the sacrifice was made. Um, And in other words, he he goes in and he sprinkles the blood coming out, not going in. And again, it's a picture that The blood is applied going out, not going in. It's a work of God for man, not a work of man for God. The way of salvation was open from God. Um, And the offerer would be watching this. He would sacrifice the animal. He would see the blood applied. He would see the priest go in, see the priest come out, sprinkling the blood. Very graphic image of the price for sin. And that's part of the purpose of this, to, to just severely, shockingly portray the price that uh, was needed to be paid for a sinful man to come before a holy God. Um, after the blood was sprinkled uh, with, with this uh, sin offering, the innards would be burned on the altar, the fat would be burned. This, this was the part that was consumed unto the, uh, unto the Lord. The rest of the carcass would be carried out and burned outside the camp. Uh, Christ fulfilled this in Hebrews 13.10 where it says he suffered outside of the gate. He would, uh, it would be taken to a clean place where the ashes of other sacrifices would be poured. The, the priest would decide somewhere outside of the tabernacle or the temple. There would be a clean place somewhere. They would, after the sacrifices, they would take the ashes and they would pour them somewhere. And that would be the same place um, the, the, this, this would be uh, taken out. It would be burned on wood in that place. Next, the trespass offering. And this is, this is different again. This was, the offering was according to practice. So not according to what you had or who you were, but according to what you had done. In this offering, Leviticus chapter 5, there are 10 specific sins that are mentioned in relationship to this offering. So we could say this, what's the difference in in the application for us and the work of the cross? What's the difference between the sin offering and the trespass offering? The sin offering is a payment for for who you are, that you are a sinner. But the trespass offering is an offering for what you have done. That's that you have sinned. I am a sinner by virtue of the imputed sins of Adam, that I am in Adam, that I am a sinner just like the rest of the human race, but then I have personally sinned. And these two sacrifices show that Christ, when he died on the cross, there was a payment for the fact that I am a sinner and also for my personal sins, making a way of mercy and forgiveness for for me. Lamb, goat, bird, and fine flour could be used in that offering. It deals with our personal sins. 2 Corinthians 5.19 not imputing our trespasses to us. 
uh, Colossians 2, 13 and 14 also, having forgiven our trespasses. The offerer, again, would confess his sins. They would be a personal, specific confession, again, uh, to one of the specific sins that are mentioned here. Um, God's portion was all that was burned, which was basically the the fat, by the way, in Middle Eastern, ancient Middle Eastern times, was the delicacy, the, 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 the part that was to be enjoyed, and that was the part that was offered, offered to the Lord, burnt on the altar. The priest had the remainder, and the offerer had nothing. And then lastly, the peace offering, again, really a result of all the others. Um, this offering was made, it was common to all. In other words, it made no difference of what you owned or what you'd done or what your position was. This was the same for everyone. You could come and you could offer um, uh, a peace offering. Uh, You could offer with this one either a male or a female. Uh, Again, the fat would be consumed on the altar. All the fat was the Lord's. Um, The breast and the right thigh would be be, um, uh, waved and then eaten. Uh, And the beautiful part about this feast, again, out of the five, this is the only one that the offerer would partake in. This was an offering that both the Lord, the priests, and the offerer enjoyed together. They would bring the peace offering, and it would be followed by communion and fellowship and feasting and enjoying um, uh, and rejoicing with thankfulness in, in that offering time. And, of course, that pictures the peace that we have with God and one another. Um, So the offerer was not a spectator but a a partaker in this. So those five offerings in the beginning, and again, to answer that question, why, why are there five offerings and what do they mean? And you can see that each offering offers a different aspect of the one final offering of Christ. Now, the priesthood is spoken of uh, in chapter 8, So the first seven chapters speak about these offerings. You have the offerings, but also you need a priest and a priesthood. No Israelite could offer by himself. The priesthood was ordained and appointed and anointed by God, had to be the sons of Aaron in the tribe of Levi. Um, First they would set up the high priest, and then the priests themselves would be chosen. As we've mentioned, that's a, a picture of the real priesthood that we have. 1 Peter 2, 5, you are part of a royal priesthood. Hebrews 4, 15, Christ is our high priest. During the Reformation, this was one of the, whatever it was, 96 points on Luther's thesis that he nailed to the door was every believer has his own believer priesthood. You don't need to go through a priest, a Catholic priest, to get to God. But you are a priest, you don't go through a priest. You are a priest. It means that you have complete access into, into God. You don't have to go and confess your sins before a man. You confess your sins to God because of the trespass offering and because of your priesthood. This is one of Luther's uh, rightful contentions with that. You don't need a mediator. We have one, and we have access to God. So the priest would be anointed for that uh, that uh, ministry, that service, as we have been anointed also. Uh, we are priests. Um, uh, we, you could say that we are priests in that we have access to God and we can speak to God about men. And you could say in a loose application that we are prophets in that we now can go and speak to men about God. These are two important parts of our life, speaking to God about men and to men about God. So we have a priest. Is that beautiful truth. Leviticus 14 and 16, we'll just quickly mention those and then we'll have a break here. But Leviticus 14 is the case of the cleansing of a leper. If someone had leprosy, um, they, could, they could come and bring an offering um, uh, by faith uh, that God could, could, uh, could heal and, and, and address that situation. And there were two birds uh, that would be to be brought in the offering. One of them was sacrificed, and the second was dipped in the blood of the first and then released. And it's beautiful that in the, in the picture, the imagery of those two birds, you have both the death and the resurrection of Christ in that 
one offering. Leviticus 16 is the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. This is the most important focus, the most important sacrificial day on the Jewish calendar. This is the day when uh, one time a year only, think of it, we looked at the model of the tabernacle together. Remember there are three main parts, the outer court, the holy place, and then the holy of holies. And only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies and only once a, on one day a year and he would go in two times. Once for himself to offer a sacrifice and then a second time for the people. So imagine that one area, the Holy of Holies, they would only one man could go into it on one day for one purpose for that one sacrifice, Yom, Yom Kippur. Um, and uh, Aaron would, uh, there would be a goat that would be offered. In fact, the first image we had for Leviticus, do I have it here? No, I don't have it here. But the first image we have for Leviticus is of a goat, and, and he's looking into the wilderness. And that's because there were two goats, similar to the two birds idea. There were two goats. One was sacrificed, and the other was, uh, it says, taken by the hands of a fit man into the wilderness and let go. And, we, and that's the scapegoat, where we get the phrase, oh, I'll be your scapegoat. That's where we get the phrase. It's from this, it's the second goat that is released into the wilderness. Um, and that happened one time every year for the sins of the people, the main um, sacrifice there. Okay, we'll take a break, and then we will, we will look at these, oh, we will look at these feasts. Okay, so I'll take a three or four minute break, and then we'll, Pick up again. Sorry? Leviticus, it, it comes from the idea of the Levites, the priests. It's not, a, it's not a person, it's just the name of the book. It's relating to the Levitical priesthood or the tribe of Levi. Yeah. Okay, one question was, how often would uh, the sacrifices be made? And of course, apart from Yom Kippur, which was the annual sacrifice for all of the, the sins of the people for that year, where their sins would be covered, um, but there would be the daily offerings, uh, which would be a morning and evening offering. It would be nine in the morning and three in the afternoon. Uh, you remember in the Acts class, some of you, that Peter and John went up at three in the, in the hour of prayer. That was the time where one of those offerings would have been made. The priests would make that offering again for the people. So twice a day for the people, every day. And then as an individual Jew and family, you, you would have the option to be bringing offerings as much or as little as you wanted to. Similar in a way as a Christian, how much you express your faith and make steps of faith and go to church or pray or read your Bible. Like it's, it's, it's part of your freedom and your expression of faith. So I could be a, a Jew who I sinned and no one knows about it, but if I want to make it right with God, I, I would get a sacrifice as an expression of faith according to the how it was laid out in the law, I would bring that sacrifice as an expression of faith uh, to God. Or if I wanted to just show my, uh, if it wasn't one of those compulsory offerings for, for a sin, I just wanted to express my praise and thankfulness to God, I would do that by means of a sacrifice. As New Testament finished work believers, um, when I sin, or when you sin, when we sin, we just come to the altar Christ is the finished work sacrifice. We just come to the altar. 1 John 1, 9, if you, com if you commit sin, confess your sin, and he will forgive you. We just come to the altar by faith in, in a moment. That, that, that event, that possibility of us to draw near and confess our sin and be forgiven is all pre-shadowed and prefigured in that whole ceremony of the tabernacle. But Christ is the sacrifice who finished the work. So, um, and equally, if I want to bring other sacrifices, not because I've sinned, but because I want to express my joy and my thankfulness, again, Hebrews thirteen seventeen, we bring a sacrifice of praise, right? Or we offer our body as a living sacrifice. So, okay, the feasts. So, Father, we pray, bless this remaining time now. In, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. 
Okay, the feast. Now, we have had some teaching on some of these, uh, so perhaps some of, the, some of them you're, we're becoming familiar with together. A couple of weeks ago in the church, we did Passover. This past Sunday, we did the seventh feast, Tabernacle. So, um, and in the Acts class, we went through the feast. So some of, some of this we'll, we'll be familiar with. So we won't labor all of it, but um, first of all, a quick mention of the Sabbaths. We don't think of the Sabbaths as a feast in the sense. Definitely not one of the main seven feasts because those seven feasts are annual, happen once a year. But the Sabbath, in a sense, was a feast of such, but it was really a weekly observance. um, And it was uh, uh, where no fire, no cooking, no work could be done on that day. If you did violate that under the law, the penalty could be death. Uh, If you look to Colossians 2.17 again, that verse speaking about the shadow, the shadow of things to come, it mentions Sabbaths and feasts in that day. Remember, it says the Sabbath or a feast day, which are a shadow of that which is to come. So again, the Sabbath day, which is a day where you are not to work but to rest, is a shadow of the Sabbath that we have, which is in Christ. Not on one day of the week, but a perpetual Sabbath in Christ. All you who labor and are heavy laden, come unto me, I will give you rest. Hebrews 4.9, there is a rest for the people of God. The Greek word is sabbatismos. It's where we get the word Sabbath. It means a holiday for the soul. And not on a day, but in, in Christ, the Sabbath. There's also what's called the year of Jubilee. Also not an annual Sabbath, but every 50 years this was. And the year of Jubilee was basically when all of the debts were leveled. Everything went back to a clean slate. Um, The properties reverted to ownership. Slaves were set free. Bank balances were leveled. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Every 50 years, if that could happen. We'd be looking forward to it, as they did also. So the people were... uh, And of course, Christ was the one who brought the ultimate... uh, Uh, jubilee uh, through the work of the cross now the seven annual feasts let's have a quick look at them so remember this chart Um, the the print is going to get bigger in a minute for anyone who's struggling with that so but anyway these are the seven feasts remember there are the the spring feasts and then there are the autumn feasts what's incredible about this as we've mentioned before is that they lay out prophetic timeline. Leviticus 23 gives us the order. Uh, Verse 2 says, these are my feasts, moedim, appointed times. God is saying, these feasts are my appointed times. Again, Colossians 2, 16, 17, a shadow of things to come. Um, And we hit the pause button and we say, wait a minute, three and a half thousand years ago, 1500 years BC, Moses is instructed to institute these feasts, and they have prophetic fulfillments in Christ. Incredible, isn't it? And this is, uh, this is again, so strengthening for our faith, and we're just amazed at the Word of God. So the spring feasts. So we'll just look at, remember, the spring, the, the spring feasts together look at the things surrounding Christ's first coming, and the fall feasts look at the events surrounding his second coming. So on the prophetic line, and at some point in our church life, we'll, have, we'll teach on the end times. I don't know if that will be in a service or for a class. I don't know, but, but it's an important teaching. But, but on the prophetic line right now, we are between the spring and the fall feasts, uh, autumn feasts. We are, um, Passover is the cross, of course, unleavened bread the second day in the tomb, first fruits he rose from the grave, and 50 days later, Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. And we are here, just before, oh, it's not there, sorry, just before the, the first of the fall feast. So let's begin with Passover. Remember, when Passover was a one-day feast that commemorated a one-time event, that was the deliverance from Egypt through the blood of the Lamb, on the 10th day, a Lamb would be chosen by every household. Um, it will be inspected for a few days. On the 14th day, it will be sacrificed and the blood would be applied to the doorpost. It wasn't enough that the, the, the lamb was just killed or sacrificed. It wasn't even enough that the blood was shed. It wouldn't have been enough if you just had the blood in a bowl 
on the table. It had to be applied. That was the instruction. Um, and again, it's not enough that Christ died for me, but there has to be an application for me to find salvation through the blood of the Lamb. So, um, on the tenth day, the Lamb will be chosen. Again, a male Lamb in the prime of life, uh, without blemish. And it would have to be applied to the doorposts that the angel of death would pass over, hence the Passover. Um, and Christ is our Passover. We remember that, I didn't have it up there, but remember 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul specifically says, Christ, our Passover. What is he saying? To, to the Jew who's hearing him say that or reading that, it's, it's loaded, so rich with meaning. He suddenly realizes, oh, the Passover, Christ is the Passover, fulfilling that feast and fulfilling the, all of the Passover lambs that are sacrificed all since Egypt, he is the Passover lamb that was sacrificed. So, again, it's, it's uh, wonderful to consider not only did he fulfill the feast, but he did so on the day, on the 14th of Nisan, which, which was such a significant event. God said, we're going to begin the religious calendar. This is the first month of the Jewish year, Nisan. And on the 14th day, that's when Christ actually died. Um, it's even very probable that he died not only on the day, but at the same time, 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Remember those two sacrifices, one at 9, one at 3 p.m., and that was also the time that the Passover lamb once a year was sacrificed and was probably the time Christ uh, said, into your hands I commit my spirit. Um, so he was crucified at 9 in the morning. That was the time of the morning sacrifice, and he actually died at 3 p.m., which was the time of the afternoon sacrifice. Um, uh, when the Lamb was chosen was the same day that Christ rode in and presented himself as king. There were some who recognized him as the Messiah, but the majority, particularly under the leaders of the Jew, Jews, uh, rejected his Messiahship. But in Luke 19.42 where he, just with a heavy heart, groaning and weeping over Jerusalem, that they would have recognized who he was. He says, you did not know this your day. They didn't recognize who he was or the day that he came. Um, but he was certainly confirmed as the lamb that was without spot. And these are all specific criteria laid out in Exodus 12 that the lamb had to be in the prime of life, a male lamb, chosen, inspected, and to be without blemish. And of course, Christ was without sin. Hebrews 4.15, 2 Corinthians 5.21, Hebrews 7.25, all say no sin, no sin, no sin. And all of the people around Christ's trials and his death, Pilate, Pilate's wife, the centurion, the thief on the cross, all of them were saying, this is a just man. There, I find no fault in him, Pilate said three times. All of them testifying to the fact that without realizing, saying, this lamb is without spot. Um, also, no bone broken, which is another prophecy. Um, and then the feast of the unleavened bread. We're familiar with the matzah now, the uh, unleavened bread, the thin crackers that we use uh, for communion on the Lord's Supper. This was the bread that was eaten for seven days. This feast began on the 15th of Nisan, the day after Passover. It lasted for a week. For a week, they were only uh, allowed to eat uh, unleavened bread, and it was uh, as they considered their deliverance from Egypt. There's at least six passages in the Old Testament that emphasize no leaven to be eaten during the feast. Again, symbolically, leaven speaking of sin. And Jesus, who was born in Bethlehem, which means the house of bread, uh, he in John 6, spoke of himself as the bread of heaven that came down from heaven. Whoever would eat, eat, of his, eat of him or believe in him would be saved. He was the seed that fell into the ground and died for salvation. Now, part of the ceremony of, uh, of the Feast of Unleavened, and it's still practiced today, is that approaching the Passover, um, the, the mother of the house will go through the house, kind of like spring cleaning, and make sure there is no leaven in the house. 
They would take all of the food out of the lot, of move all of the furniture, sweep through the whole house to make sure that all leaven is removed. And part of this ceremony um, that went along with that is that afterwards some pieces of leaven would be purposely hidden in the house. The father would come home and there was a little game that went with it that he would have to find the leaven and the kids would kind of be saying, oh, warmer, colder, to help him find the leaven, and then he would take it out of the house. This, and at the end of that, they would say, now this house is worthy to celebrate the Passover. They would do that up, up, up to the feast. Now, so in this feast, we see, of course, Christ was the one without leaven. He was the one without sin. And he, not only was he without sin, but he also removed sin. Just like they took the leaven out of the house, Christ removed sin. He was the lamb that what? Took away the sins of the world. He was the one without sin who became a sin offering and removed sin from the world, from the earth. And um, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 um, that he died. He died and was buried and rose, but the second one, he died and was buried according to the scriptures. And part of that is just in this uh, prophetic imagery of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He, he was buried. Uh, and of course, he died on the Passover and he was in the tomb when the Feast of Unleavened Bread began. The sinless one who was put in the tomb uh, waiting to, to fulfill the Feast of first fruits on the next day. Um, there's so much we could say, but let's just move to first fruits. First fruits. Uh, again, these are all in Leviticus 23. Um, this is a, this is the third day after Passover. Again, to think that he was crucified on one day, and then on the third day he actually rose, uh, fulfilling the feast of first fruits. You could sometimes the Romans the Roman design of crucifixion wasn't only to inflict excruciating pain where we get the word crucifixion, excruciating pain, but also to prolong the process that you would not only suffer, but you would do for hours, in some cases, days. Um, In that particular case, with Christ, of course, the Roman soldier was going to break the legs to to shorten the process so so that they would die. But when they came to Christ, he had already died. And the reason for that was because he had another feast to fulfill the few feasts to fulfill with the unleavened bread and then the first fruits. That's why he had to resurrect on the third day to fulfill that feast. Again, Paul says, by the way, the spring feasts, how many are there? Four. And then there's three autumn feasts, right? All four of the spring feasts are mentioned by Paul in, let's think, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. Yeah, all to the church of Corinth. I don't know why that is, but that's the case. They're all in 1 Corinthians, the book of 1 Corinthians. Um, so, first fruits, uh, uh, the famous resurrection chapter in chapter 15, Paul, in the clearest words, says, Christ, our first fruits. And what he's saying there, he's speaking about the order of the resurrection, and he says, Christ, the first fruits, and then them that are his. And he's saying, Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. He, he represents the rest of of the harvest to come. Because in the feast, this was celebrating the barley feast. Um, I've read traditionally that members of the Sanhedrin would go into three different fields. They would lay down a hoop, a ring, in the, in the time of sowing the, the seed. They would sow the, the seed in the field, and whatever grew up through that hoop, they would put it together in one sheaf, They would go up to the temple with ceremony, wave the sheaf offering as an offering before the Lord. And that was the first fruits. And it was understood. And you couldn't partake of any of the harvest until that offering had taken place. And it was understood that that offering represented the rest of the offering that followed. And Christ was the first fruits. In other words, he he ascended into heaven representing the rest of the harvest that was followed. In Hebrews 9.20 uh, for he appeared in heaven itself for us. He represents the whole harvest. John fourteen nineteen. because I live, you shall also live. 
he will return to collect the rest of the harvest, and that's the church. Now, 50 days after this, oh, there's the presentation of the sheaf, uh, and Christ, our first fruits. 50 days after this, it's sometimes called the Feast of Weeks. It was seven weeks plus one, 50 days. Pente comes from 50. Is the Feast of Pentecost. Barley, first fruits at the Feast of First Fruits. And this was the wheat harvest that was celebrated at Pentecost. Well, over those weeks, they would be gathering the barley, and now there will be the first fruits of the wheat harvest at Pentecost. And of course, we remember Acts 2 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come not the next day or the day before, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came because that is what the the feast represents. It's the coming of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church, the beginning of the church age. Um, mm -mm -mm. There's a few distinctions to be made, which are interesting to note, between the first fruits offering and the offering at Pentecost. The first fruits offering, again, we mentioned it was barley, and it was a sheaf. In the Pentecost offering, it was uh, loaves that were made from wheat, and two loaves. Um, why two loaves? And, and uh, I think we can uh, make a speculation that it's to do with uh, the the birth of the church, we see two main outpourings of the Holy Spirit to the Jews in Acts 2, to the Gentiles in Acts 10. But the two loaves were one offering. So one offering, but two distinct poor you know, uh, uh, events with the Jews and the Gentiles, but becoming one in one church. And the most important distinction between the offerings is that the offering at first fruits was unleavened bread, because it spoke of Christ, but the Offering at Pentecost is the only offering where it clearly said, you shall use leavened bread. And it's because it speaks of us. But we are sinners in the church. And that offering represents the, the church. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, so I think we have that up there maybe. Yeah, two loaves. Jew and Gentiles in one body. Uh, it would be ground, individual grains baked in the loaf, made with leaven, with sinners saved by grace. Oh, and that's the other point. It was to be mixed with oil. Leavened bread mixed with oil, and of course, oil always represents the Holy Spirit, and that's exactly what happened at Pentecost on the feast, the coming of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. Okay, so they're the spring feasts. Um, and now we want to look ahead to the Autumn feasts, again, these are prophetic. This is exciting because we can clearly look back to the feasts that have been fulfilled, and also we can clearly look forward to the feasts that are waiting to be fulfilled. Similar, in a similar way, we can look back to prophecies that have been fulfilled and prophecies that are waiting. We can do that with the feasts. Before we speak about what the feasts represent, let's do a little timeline. This is just about as simple a timeline as we can get just to give us the bare basics on the uh, on the timeline. So this is the Old Testament period here. And of course, this is uh, the first advent, the coming of Christ, represented in the three first feasts, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Right here is Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. Right? Followed very quickly by the Feast of Pentecost, the beginning of the church age. So we are in this period. Um, we like to think and hope that we're right at the end, but we don't know exactly. But we are in the church age, and we have a living hope and expectation for the return of Christ uh, and what's called the rapture, when Christ uh, will come and he will gather the church in the air before a time of judgment on the earth. Don't worry if this is all... We'll reinforce it. and it'll, This is one of those things that gets clearer each time you hear it. So... So this, the church age ends with the rapture and is followed by a seven-year period of judgment on the earth. Um, and at the end of that judgment, right at the end here, is the national salvation of Israel because they finally believe on their Messiah, which ushers in his return and is followed by a thousand-year literal reign on the earth, with Christ reigning on the earth. Now, so let's, let's break it up with... Um, 
three main events that the feast represent. The first one is the rapture, is represented by the Feast of Trumpets. The second coming is represented by the Day of Atonement. And the millennial reign, the final literal kingdom, where God's promises will be realized, his faithfulness will be shown, Israel will finally fully inherit the land uh, on the earth, is represented in the Feast of Tabernacles. So let's now have a quick look at the feasts, the autumn feasts. Um, First of all, the Feast of Trumpets. This is a one-day celebration. This is in the month of uh, Tishri. Remember, we're actually in that Jewish month now. It's the end of September and beginning of October. We're right in the month of Tishri on the Jewish calendar now. 17th, 18th. We're in the 19th of Tishri. They're still celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles until the 22nd. Right? See that? 15th to the 22nd. So, uh, it's a one-day one, uh, celebration. It's at the first of the month of Tishri. And um, uh, it's involved with, remember, all of these feasts are involved with the last of three pilgrimages. There'll be three trips every Jewish male would make to Jerusalem to observe the feast. This is the last one in the autumn. Um, We said on Sunday that the Feast of Tabernacles is a little bit like our Harvest Festival. Um, Uh, here you see the celebration of the first fruits of the barley. Here the first fruits of the wheat. And tabernacles is the first fruits of the corn. So these feasts fall in line with, with the, the harvest. Okay, so trumpets is a one-day celebration on the first of the month. Um, it's a memorial, of course, in, involving blowing trumpets, although trumpets is a misleading word. It would be the shofar, the ram's horn which I have a picture of in a minute. I didn't bring one in to blow because they're so hard to, if you've ever tried. Though I have one, but they're hard to blow. My children can do it. Um, and, uh, and the blowing of trumpets, obviously, is a significant part of this feast. Um, the Hebrew, zikaron teruah, literally a remembrance blast, it means. Um, so you, we've, we've had no feast for the previous months, the hottest months, by the way, in Israel, and then this feast is the feast to blow trumpets, Numbers 21.9, the day to blow trumpets. Uh, Yom Teruah. Uh, where is it? Yom Teruah, also known as Rosh Hashanah, right? These are both names for the same idea. Uh, Yom Teruah is the term that means literally a day of blowing. A day of blowing. And the key word Teruah here means staccato blasts, short staccato blasts, uh, a series of staccato sounds on the shofar. Um, It's beautiful that this is a picture of the rapture because we know that the rapture, is it here or here? Um, I didn't put it on here, but anyway, first... Thessalonians 4.16, Paul, speaking about the return of Christ, says that um, when Christ shall return, he will return with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, the trumpet of God. 1 Corinthians 15.52, again here he, where he, he says, um, we shall be changed, and it's speaking about the resurrection of the believers, we shall be changed, remember in the twinkling of an eye, at the, at the, at the last trump. Now, the Corinthians would have understood there's a definite article there, not a last trump, but the last trump. And this is referring to the Tekia Gedola, is the Hebrew term. It's the climax of the feast, and it means the great blowing of the trumpet. So you would have staccato sounds of the trumpet through the feast all the day, but it would end with the great blowing, or the last trump. So when Paul says you will be changed at the last trump and we will hear the sound of the trumpet. They, they, there was an understanding he was referring to. Again, Paul is saying here, Christ has fulfilled these feasts and this feast is yet to be fulfilled. The sound of the trumpets. Um, now, uh, in Joel 2.1, 
It says, blow the trumpet, again, the shofar, in Zion. Sound the alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming um, and is near. And by the way, every time you hear that phrase, the day of the Lord, and we read it a lot in the Old Testament, it's referring to the time of judgment on the earth. I could skip back there for a minute. It's referring to, this is the day of the Lord. Some, some believe it's just the last three and a half years of this or the whole year, but either way, the time of God's wrath poured out on the earth during the tribulation period. That's referring to the day of the Lord. It includes the time of judgment and his second coming is referring to the day of the Lord. So Joel here says, blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm for the day of the Lord is coming. So the trumpets are before the day of the Lord. Now, between the trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets, um, shall I go back? Yeah, okay, sorry. Sorry to jump back and forth. But Between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement, you'll notice there are 10 days, right? This is on the first day. This is on the 10th day. Those 10 days were um, understood to the, to the Jews. They were called the Days of Awe or the days of repentance, those 10 days between trumpets and Yom Kippur. Um, they uh, They understood that the Feast of Trumpets to the Jew brought a time of judgment, followed by days of awe before the final day of judgment, which is on the Day of Atonement, of course, when the, when the goat is judged on their behalf for, the, for their sins. So, um, so you have the trumpets followed by the 10 days of affliction followed by uh, Yom Kippur, which represents the second coming. So it means you have the trumpets, which is the rapture. You have the time of judgment on the earth, the seven-year seven uh, tribulation, or figured here in the 10 days of judgment, and that's followed by the uh, Yom Kippur. Now, Trumpets indicate a specific day in the Jewish year. The first trump is blown on the Feast of Pentecost. It's proclaimed that God had betrothed himself to Israel. The last trump, and again, that's what Paul referred to, is synonymous with Rosh Hashanah. According to Theodore Gasta in his book, Festivals in the Jewish Year, in his chapter on Rosh Hashanah, Hermel Kivir also states the same thing in his book, the high and holy days in the chapter of the Shofar. The great trump is blown on Yom Kippur. Now, one beautiful thing about this feast, now listen carefully, this is the only feast on which you did not know what day the feast would begin. And that's fascinating because the Lord said, no man knows the day or the hour of his return. Isn't that amazing? The only festival no man knows exactly when it will occur. It begins on the new moon identified when two witnesses attest to it before the Sanhedrin in the temple. In other words, you'd have two witnesses, two men waiting, looking at the night sky. And as soon as they saw the first slither of the new moon, they would hightail it back to the temple, tell the Sanhedrin and say, the feast can begin. So they were waiting, waiting, not knowing when the day would come. And that's like us in the church age. We are waiting for the sound of the trumpet. We are waiting for the rapture. No man knows when it will happen, but it could happen on any moment. It's incredible, that little detail in there, isn't isn't it, in that feast that no man knows the the day or the hour. So no one knows when the Feast of Trumpets would start. It could start on one of a couple of days. We know the season, but not the day or the hour, according to Matthew 24. We know the season. We can see the signs of the times. We know it could happen at any time, but no man knows the day or the hour. And again, going back to this verse in Colossians 2.16, we mentioned the feasts are in that verse, also the Sabbath is in that verse, and also the new moon is in that verse, speaking about the Feast of Trumpets. The new moon is a shadow of the reality. The new moon feast and trumpets is a shadow of the reality of the rapture and the coming of Christ. Okay, the Day of Atonement. So in, uh, in Leviticus 23, again, these are all laid out. Uh, day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, as is, is better known, is a day where they would afflict the soul. Uh, 
Leviticus 23, 27, you will afflict your soul. There will be sorrow and mourning and repentance. They would deny themselves certain things and pleasures. They would be confessing their sin. They would be fasting. They would be praying. This was a day of great sorrow and repentance and confession before God because this is the day when there will be the national sacrifice once a year where the high priest would go in. Remember, this is Yom Kippur. So this is a day of great affliction, a national day of repentance. Notice this, a national day of repentance after the 10 days of affliction. That falls in line with the timeline. A national day of repentance after the seven-year tribulation period. The purpose of the tribulation is to bring the Jewish nation to this place of brokenness and repentance when they will finally recognize and accept Jesus was and is the Messiah. It's called, I think it's Jeremiah 30, verse 8, or somewhere like that, verse 7, the time of Jacob's trouble. Is, the, is another name for the tribulation. It's, it's Jacob's trouble. It's when the Jews will be, will be broken. And at the end of the tribulation... Uh, that verse that troubles some Christians, I think it's Romans 11.25, where it says, all of Israel shall be saved, is referring to the remnant survivors of the tribulation period. Uh, Zechariah 13.7 tells us that only one-third of the Jews that begin the tribulation will survive until the end. It will be the greatest, great, greater holocaust than the Second World War. So many will be suffer and die at the persecution of the Antichrist during that time, particularly the last three and a half years. And at the end of the tribulation, the remnant, that one-third that's left, will, Zechariah 12.10, look to him whom they have pierced. They will be mourning and crying. They will recognize him as the Messiah, and that will usher in his return, which is what the Day of Atonement um, figures. So this is the most important day for the nation, that special sacrifice of the goat offering for the people. A day of sorrow, troubled hearts, humiliation, repentance. Uh, but then uh, what, it, what, it pre- what it looks to is the, is the return of the Lord. And of course, the last feast, which we spoke of on Sunday, which we don't need to labor too much, uh, the last feast, again, this re- um, commemorate or celebrating the end of the agricultural year, as well as the end of the uh, religious calendar, the last of the seven feasts. Um, It pictures here, uh, remember the feast was they would make booths, little tents or temporary shelters to remember their wilderness journey. And as Jews in the land for generations following, they could remember, oh, we were in the wilderness, but now he's brought us into the land. But the Feast of Tabernacles ultimately, prophetically, looks to the time when they really will be brought into the land. After that time of judgment, when they look to Christ, when he returns, he sets up his kingdom, and then they will inherit the land. Then the Feast of Tabernacles is really fulfilled when they, their journey is really over as a nation, and they will be finally settled in the promised land as, as Abraham was promised all the way back in the beginning. So it pictures the millennial reign. Remember, the characteristic of this feast is a time of incredible rejoicing. That is a key key note of it. Feasting, rejoicing, a time of peace, rest, and joy, where they will now be in the land in a fixed dwelling with the millennial temple that will be, be built and God's promises completely fulfilled. Okay? Amen. So, Father, thank you for this time together and these amazing thoughts. Just bless bless them to our hearts and give us joy and faith and thanksgiving uh, offerings in our hearts to you all through this week. We pray for those who need a physical touch and healing. We just know that so many are suffering from different uh, ailments right now. And we just bring that to you in faith. Please be faithful and merciful to different ones and We pray for this coming service. We pray for Saturday outreach and Sunday service. Just give us a beautiful time, a celebration of just seeing you draw people and speak to people and and hopefully save people, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, any uh, closing questions or comments? Uh, Feel free. 
Oh, that's just another chart of the same thing showing you the spring feasts and the fall feasts. Yes? Sorry? Well, the Jews don't, don't recognize that the, the feasts have any prophetic relevance. We only see that from the light of the New Testament. We can clearly see Christ was the Passover. Paul taught us that in the New Testament. The Jews don't see any prophecy here. Um, there is that mystical blindness that, that, that there are certain elements of, of, of Jesus being the Messiah. They, they cannot recognize that. But these are the types of things. If you ever get a Jew who is really searching and open, of course you can use prophecies, but a lot, a lot of this typology you can use and, and show them. You know, yeah. But effectively they are, they are waiting for the Messiah just as we are. The only difference is we realize it's, this is his second time. And the first time he died on the cross and the second time he sits on the throne. And they're also waiting for the Messiah who will come and sit on the throne. But they just don't recognize that it was Jesus and he, he, he already came. But they, they will. They will. Yeah. Oh, by the way, something to pray about is uh, that we are pray, prayerfully pr- praying, prayerfully praying, prayerfully planning um, a trip to Israel for the church. And uh, we're really going to put the feelers out and see what type of response there might be. But it could be a year from now, so it'll be in October 2018. Uh, if not, we'll see. It'll be, it'll be October 2019. But we're getting together some of the uh, information and the prices and things like that. But it'll be a rich time for, uh, for individuals and for the church. So let's be praying about that. Yes, any questions? Yes, put your name there. There's no, there's no prize for the first name. Uh, if there was, my name's already on there, sorry. Yeah. With the tabernacle, um, would there be like loads of tabernacles um, around the Israel area? All over? You mean the little booths for the Feast of Tabernacles? Yeah. Yeah, all over, yeah. M- mainly around Jerusalem. They would come because they would come to Jerusalem to celebrate the the feasts on those three pilgrimages. So the, when the Feast of Tabernacles began, there would be these little tabernacles through the hills, through the streets, on the rooftops, in the temple courtyard, thousands of them. Yeah. Okay.